Welcome to this special edition of Arlington Public News. I'm James Milan. Tonight, we introduce you to three new faces of Arlington. As summer wraps up, one of our guests is preparing to meet students when school doors open, another is opening hearts and minds to the universal language of poetry, and the third is working to keep Arlington going green. We'll meet our first new face when we come back. When school opens this fall, Roderick McNeil will be greeting students at the door. The new assistant superintendent of Arlington Schools wants students, parents, and faculty to know him and feel comfortable coming to him. He makes the sometimes difficult transition from teacher to administrator look easy because, he says, the students remain his principal focus. News director Heather Avison sat down with McNeil recently, and here's their conversation. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're here with Mr. Roderick McNeil, Jr., the new assistant superintendent here at the Arlington Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, um, I started, actually I was an elementary school teacher uh, around, I started in 1996. Uh, I'm actually, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in my life and um, so I uh, started substitute teaching and uh, I decided I wanted to go back to school and, and I got my uh, teacher certification in uh, elementary education and early childhood development at Wayne State University which is a local university in Detroit and uh, so I started teaching and my first teaching job was third grade and and I was uh, just fell in love with the interactions with the kids and, and providing um, instruction for them not only with through academics but also helping with their social and emotional learning development and uh, so there was a, a job in, a, in another school district that I applied for for a K-5 principal position and I was awarded I was lucky enough again to, to receive that position and I was there for about three years and, and we were doing some really great things and they, they actually my school was closed due to uh, decreasing enrollment hmm. and um, they were consolidating on that side of the town. They were consolidating three schools down to two. But uh, and initially, I didn't know whether or not um, I was going to have a job. So I, uh, I sent my resume out uh, through various search engines. And uh, I, was, I got a call back from Needham. You know, I went through the interview process there. And that, that's what brought me to Massachusetts, of course, with the blessing of my wife. <laughs> and um, so I was there for about four years. We did some great things. and. Uh, when I left, we had uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to uh, achieve the level one status, DESE status, mm -hmm. and named to the co uh, state accommodation list. And then I saw this position, and uh, you know I, I was attracted to it because of the diversity in, in Arlington and the way that the, the the population of Arlington is growing. And I also uh, was was very um, I, I developed a relationship with uh, uh, Dr. Bodie, the superintendent. We had you know, many. Uh, great conversations and you know I was fortunate enough to get the position and now I'm so happy to be here. You never know what's going to happen when you put your resume out there and so I'm, I was very fortunate to end up in Massachusetts. Uh, my kids have uh, acclimated very nicely to the environment and you know it's safe and the, and the parks. The one thing that I'm really uh, impressed about you know just the local parks that are available in each one of the towns it's just amazing you know, all the uh, you know public recreation facilities that are available uh, that don't cost anything, you know? So I'm so happy to be here. A lot of educators struggle with the transition from the classroom mm -hmm. to the principal's office. It mm -hmm. sounds like you're very comfortable moving back and forth between mm -hmm. those two. Mm -hmm. What To what do you attribute that? I think my love of instruction, classroom instruction, uh, really keeps, kept me connected with the with the kids and um, with that emphasis on trying to uh, find different formats that will meet many different uh, learning styles, uh, that's something that you know I was held as um, a priority for me. And so even at, even when I became, uh, you know, was appointed to an administrative position, I still kept that connection by visiting classrooms. And I think that's very important, especially in the position that I'm in now, if I'm going to impact instruction on a district-wide level, I'm going to need to keep that pace of 
visiting uh, schools and I've already had conversations with Dr. Bodie about, you know, making that a priority in my mm -hmm. schedule, especially in my first year. Sure, Just get comfortable with absolutely. where all the schools are, what the personalities absolutely. of Absolutely, and learning is. the culture of the district. And, mm -hmm. and I want teachers to know me by name. Mm -hmm. And again, I, when I walk into their classroom, I don't want it to be, oh, the assistant superintendent is. I, I want them to feel like, oh, I'm there to support them and to you know, listen to them and observe them. And, and that will help my, um, my learning process as I, as I find out what the needs and the priorities are for the and, district. And that's why we have you here today so that you can get to know the faces of Arlington Absolutely. and Arlington can get to know your face. Absolutely. So be careful. <laughs> Everyone's gonna know you now. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you mentioned your children. Mm -hmm. um, you have a pretty busy life right now. I, do. I think you've got three young girls. Yes. Uh, one of one in her teens now. Yes. So that's going to keep you busy. You've got mm -hmm. a new job and you're getting a doctorate at Boston College. I am. Tell I us, am. Um, tell us about the doctorate and, and what your focus is. So, uh, you know, I was attracted to the program at, at BC, at Boston College, because of their emphasis on social justice and also because it, was, it caters to a working professional in the educational field. Uh, and so the name of the uh, program is the PSAP program uh, for Professional School Administrators uh, Program. And, uh, and, and it allows you to get your assistant superintendent and superintendent license, as well as obtaining a doctorate in educational uh, leadership. So it's an EDD. Uh, and so I've learned a lot. It's a cohort model, so um, I work with other educators who are in leadership positions. And that's been very uh, nice because it, it gives me an opportunity to look at various uh, issues from different perspectives and to um, really build uh, my repertoire of strategies uh, for dealing with certain situations. And it's courses that are taught are by um, active superintendents, uh, former superintendents, uh, assistant superintendents so you're also able to share practice with people who are actually in the field and so uh, that's it's been great and finally what are you looking forward to the most when the school doors open in September just getting into classrooms and seeing instruction and seeing the kids and making those connections with parents uh, I want parents to know me by name you know I again I want to have a presence uh, within the schools uh, and uh, and I want people to be able to use me as a resource if they need something. And uh, I just want to build that bridge and that connection between central office. And not that it's not already here in, in Arlington. Um, that's one of the things that attracted me to Arlington is because of the focus on uh, instruction and providing the tools that teachers can utilize in the classroom, again, to meet all different learning levels. And you know, I, I have to back up. I have to make sure that I, I mention my wife. Uh, when you ask me how do I manage all the craziness, uh, we're lucky enough that she's able to stay home. And uh, so she's a big support and a big reason that I'm able to do the things that I'm able to do. And how about those three girls? Do they give you, uh, do you, do you go to them and say, you know, I've been thinking about this happening in the middle schools. What do you think about that? Do you, you know, do I you do I, their yeah, brains? Absolutely. I, I, you know, when I first moved to Massachusetts, uh, I, I, I was the principal of the John Elliott School in Needham and uh, my, uh, my oldest daughter, was just going into fifth grade so she actually went to my school oh. and my middle child who was uh, you know eventually uh, moved into kindergarten she also went to my school for kindergarten and first grade so they would come home and give me feedback and so uh, and that would help me make some it was very honest feedback. it was very honest <laughs> feedback sometimes I had to sit there and just listen uh, but it was helpful and I think that's you bring up a good point you know a, a large part I've talked about parents I've talked about students and working with other faculty members but I think also getting that feedback from students uh, is also very helpful uh, and that's and that's a connection I think that it's that's going to be a huge focus of my job as well we are Happy to have you here and happy to have you going into the Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much for this opportunity. Welcome, Mr. McNeil. We look forward to seeing you in the schools and around town. Ken Pruitt is the town's first energy and project manager. If there's a way to fulfill Arlington's green community commitment, he'll find it. We'll meet him after the break. If you live in one of the 22 communities that appear on your screen now, you likely belong to the Mystic River watershed. This vital resource is a natural living system that we all share. Since 1972, the Mystic River Watershed Association has successfully fought to protect and restore 
this treasure. Now I'm asking you to join that effort. Please go to mysticriver.org to become a member and to find out how you can help today. In 2010, Arlington earned a Green Community designation from the Massachusetts Office of Environmental Affairs. The town agreed to welcome renewable energy projects, reduce municipal energy use by 20% within five years, purchase fuel-efficient vehicles, and require construction of larger building projects to be 20% more energy efficient than in the past. The designation makes Arlington eligible for Green Communities grants. The town has already received a number of grants, bringing in close to $1.5 million in project funding. As energy and project manager, Ken Pruitt will be responsible for obtaining and managing the grants and the associated projects. Pruitt has spent almost 20 years working in conservation and environmental resource management and policy. He looks forward to seeing his policy work put into practical application. APN reporter Mitch McLeod recently sat down with Ken Pruitt. I'm the energy and project manager for the town of Arlington. Okay, um, jumping right in, what does that project entail? Or what does that position entail? The position entails. So uh, I, there's kind of two main components to it. One, I'm trying to reduce energy use by, by town buildings, so the schools and the town hall and the other town buildings, um, through energy efficiency measures, you know, putting in more efficient lighting, increasing um, insulation, and that type of thing. And then on the, on the flip side, I'm trying to increase the amount of clean energy that the town is producing. So most of that would be solar panels on roofs. So it's reducing energy on one side and producing clean energy on the, on the other side. What do you envision being some challenges with this new position? Funding is always a big challenge. You know, there's only so much available in tax money for one thing. Um, most of, almost all the money that we use to pay for energy efficiency projects in the town um, actually comes from the state, from the Green Communities uh, Grant Program. And so that doesn't, not only does that not actually cost taxpayers anything, um, taxpayers save because all the projects that, that we do actually reduce energy use. And that, of course, reduces the tax burden. But there, of course, there's only a certain amount of money available for in, in green communities grant money from the state. And more and more communities every year are joining, becoming green communities. And so there's more and more towns trying to get money from the same the same pot of money, but we've been, Arlington's been very successful and has, has brought in a lot of money over the last several years. With this new position, what are you looking forward to the most? Um, you know, I'm looking forward to a lot of different things. The, this, this position is really kind of a, a dream job for me. Um, you know, I've been working in environmental policy for the last several years, which is great, but um, I've, I've missed more of the hands-on experience of conceiving of projects, whether it be a lighting, a new set of lights in a school that are much more energy efficient, um, or putting solar panels on a roof that doesn't have any solar panels, um, and getting that done and seeing the tangible impact of, of a project that I conceive of and then manage and implement. Um, and so that's very exciting to me. It's, you know, it's, it's just exciting to be in Arlington at all um, from the get-go, because this town is, not only is it a green community, um, you know, quite a few towns are green communities, but Arlington is known as a, a really progressive town. Um, you know, the town manager, Adam Chapdelaine himself, is, is very committed to, uh, to greening the town. And so, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people who care about these issues in the town. There's a lot of people serving in volunteer roles, you know, outside of um, people who are in the government. And that creates a lot of momentum. So I think we'll be able to get a tremendous amount done. It's just a, it's a, a great place to be. Can you talk a little bit about what you did as the executive director of the Environmental League of Massachusetts in your sure. previous position? Yeah, so I was at the Environmental League of Massachusetts, or ELM, for the last nine years. And uh, so in that role, I was, you know, did a variety of things. Um, I worked, I did some, did some lobbying at the State House, um, did some research on issues. I managed, you know, about seven staff people. I was in charge of uh, fundraising, managing our budgets. You know, all the things that you would typically associate with running, running a nonprofit. You know, so we had 10 staff people. ELM has actually been around since 1898. Um, always working on advocacy, always focused on protecting the Massachusetts environment, and always focused on Beacon Hill. How do you feel like that position prepared you for undertaking this new position here in Arlington? Um, you know, it prepared me in, in, I think, a number of ways. For one thing, we, we climate change and Clean energy was uh, ELM's top focus, 
So I've, while this is a new position for me here in Arlington, working on a whole set of, of projects that I haven't worked on before, the, the concepts I have worked on for the last nine years. And, you know, we, we fought for state funding for the, the very grant program that, that Arlington now receives money for, the Green Communities Grant Program. And so I kind of, I have a sense of, of what, you know, where Arlington sits in the pack. Um, it's, it's, you know, doing a great job, you know, near the top of the pack, if not at the top of the pack, uh, for sustainability. And so it, I have a sense of essentially what other towns are doing and have done. And so I bring that knowledge with me. And, and uh, over time, there may be projects that we do here that, that I, I promote because I saw it done somewhere else. You know, you're new in the position, but what are some mm -hmm. issues you know of coming in that you're going to need to tackle here in the coming years? Right. I think, I, I think probably the biggest one is that we're looking at um, building a new high school. And, you know, these school buildings uh, use a tremendous amount of energy. And so a big question is going to be how energy efficient um, are we going to make the new high school? And, you know, small tweaks in design can have a major uh, energy and climate impact because it, it is such a big facility. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, more, um, the more you push towards sort of perfection on energy use, most of the time, the higher the cost initially to build the school. Over time, you save money because you're using less energy and the school building lasts for decades. But up front, I think there's going to be, you know, um, a balancing act where we look at trying to make the school as efficient as possible. Um, and, um, but looking at the initial cost that, that the taxpayers have to fund. Can you speak about the challenges being thrown into projects that you didn't start, you didn't brainstorm? Um, are you really <laughs> finishing up what was already there? Are you making changes to these projects that were already started? Right. I mean, that is a big challenge. So, um, you know, coming in, you know, I, I, I'm learning where all the town buildings, including the schools, are, for one thing. <laughs> I've never been in most of these buildings, um, even for a minute. So, as I look at these projects that are underway, and it talks about, you know, um, you know, the bracket school lighting project, well, where's the bracket school and what kind of lights are we talking about and how many classrooms and, you know, what was the purpose of the project and so on and so forth. So there, there is a challenge of just simply coming up to speed, you know, in a new, in a new position. Um, I think the projects that the town is doing right now towards energy efficiency were very well conceived and smart. Um, and so I, I don't anticipate, um, you know, looking at major changes to them. At this point, it's just implementing them and then, um, and then conceiving the next round, the next round of projects. Seeing that this is a new position, mm -hmm. um, what kind of areas are you being fed projects from? Um, so, you know, I don't really know yet. I know there's a capital planning committee that comes up with capital projects. Um, I know that the facilities department that I'm a part of um, looks at projects. I know uh, in some cases, um, uh, teachers or the principals in schools will um, contact the facilities department and say, listen, um, it's too dim in a classroom or in a hallway or in a stairwell, and we'd like brighter lights. And that's an opportunity when you replace those lights to make them LEDs as opposed to incandescents, for example. Um, and so I think some of this, and you know, the, the fact that we have to build a new high school, that sort of creates a mandate to, to to do a lot of planning on energy that, that we just have to do because the, the high school is coming. Anything else you'd like to say? Uh, just that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to be here. It's a, as I say, it's a great town. It's, um, it's an exciting job for me. It's something that I've wanted to do for a while. And when the position opened up, I jumped on it and applied. And i um, just grateful that I got the position. I'm happy to be here. Look forward to meeting a lot of people in town. Arlington can be proud of its commitment to energy conservation and renewables. Look for lots of new initiatives with Ken Pruitt at the helm. Longtime Arlington resident, teacher, and poet, Kathy Desjardins is also the town's second poet laureate. She's on a mission to make poetry accessible to everyone. You'll meet her when we come back. Hello, my name is Kylie Sullivan, and I'm a health compliance officer with the Arlington Board of Health. At the Board of Health, we interpret and enforce state, federal, and local regulations pertaining to health, specifically regarding food establishments, housing issues, and nuisance complaints such as pests, odors, and noises. For more information, please visit the town website or you can give us a call at 
3170. If terms like iambic pentameter, sonnet, and haiku put you off of poetry, we have the cure. Arlington's new poet laureate, Kathy Desjardins, is committed to poetry as storytelling. Working with toddlers and octogenarians, she makes poetry reading and writing accessible to all. Ms. Desjardins shared her vision of poetry and her goals as poet laureate with news director Heather Avison. Thank you for joining us oh, today and congratulations on your yeah. new appointment as poet laureate here Thank in Arlington. You. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about your background, what got you inspired to begin writing, and when that happened? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think my background is very patchwork in a lot of ways, except consistently I have been a teacher of many different kinds of people and many ages of people, everything from pre-K to grad school to adult ed, and I'm certified K-12. So um, I, I like teaching because I like to learn. And uh, teaching teaches me a lot. I really like making connections um, across, from one discipline to another. From um, Last year I ended up uh, at the Thompson School working with kindergartners, and then I would jump in my car and I went to a senior assisted living <laughs> facility. So I went from literally from kindergartners to, uh, you know, seniors, and um, and it was great. And there were a lot of things in common. I was going to ask you yes, what crossovers absolutely. did you see, and what what transitions did you see, and what crossovers in those two oh, populations? So I think that what I saw that struck me the most was a love of story that um, I work a, a lot of times with the little wild ones um, in, in kindergarten, not the senior, well, the seniors too, the wild, <laughs> those wild ones. Uh, but I think you can tame them with stories, and half of it is really connecting them to stories that they love, where they're excited about the stories. And with the seniors too, I found that that idea of stories, I mean, there were people in the room who were saying, I didn't know, I had no idea of that, that that happened to you, or you lived there, or that's what your family were like, or that that happened to you. And so there's a, a lot of energy in stories and language to share that. Do you find that poetry opens a particular door for some people who are struggling to tell their stories? Absolutely. I think that, you know, um, people always say, well, why is it a poem? Because now we're saying, well, you can have a poem about vegetables, and you can have a poem about television, and you can have a poem about anything. So why is that a poem? And I really like a definition that um, William Stafford, who's a wonderful poet who, who died a few years ago, uh, said that a poem is, is really a call for you to pay attention mm. to something. So it's, you've got this white space around it. There aren't that many words. So the white space is saying, you know what I'm saying here, take a good look at it, and can you listen to it? So uh, I think that that is a call to pay attention to it. And I think that now it's needed more than ever because there's so much language mm. coming in on us. There's so much coming in at us all the time, that that idea of, hey, can you pay attention to this for a minute, that that's more important than ever. So it's really getting to the heart of some poem, something, the essence Right, of right, it. right. One of my favorite things to do with a poem that um, a high school English teacher taught me to do is to reveal a poem line by line. Mm. So you, you read a line and you say, what's the next line? Mm. to kids and or anyone to anyone and you have to think about that so then you, you say it's not right or wrong it's your version but it has to fit what went before and then you construct it construct it construct it and you're attending to everything that's ahead of it so that's an amazing uh, way to pay attention to things and I think it's getting harder and harder and harder to do that I um have bl these black raspberry bushes, and I was uh, thinking I wanted to maybe write about them. So I found a couple of really good poems, written by one by Seamus Heaney and one by Sylvia Plath. One's called Blackberry, and one's called Blackberry Picking. And the Sylvia Plath one was so wonderful. It's about a walk down uh, in an ocean setting, and she calls them the hooks 
uh, the landscape and she talks about all uh, everything that's around it in the end you kind of walk out on the ocean and there's no this noise like someone beating mm. tin I think she says and it's this she's really um, in that landscape and thinking about those berries and thinking about what's around them in the air and the water and um, it's so wonderful and I thought that poem I wonder if that poem could happen anymore hmm. because if we were if you were there or I were there we, everyone would probably have their cell phones out <laughs> and they would pictures. be taking so, pictures of right. oh look here there's a <laughs> lot of blackberries on this bush I can't believe it I'm gonna take a picture of, you know and no one would be and and it, it kind of I hurt my heart a little bit I thought can we can we write that can, can we read and write those kinds of poems anymore you know it's just and how are you going to bring that <laughs> <laughs> to the poet laureate position oh, you obviously well, already have yeah. a very strong connection to yeah, yeah. working with the schools and the elderly right, in town right right um i'm gonna guess that's what drew you to this position yeah. to think about it yeah and how yeah. do you want to expand what you've already been doing through this position. Um, I'm hoping to meet with the superintendent. I think we can get plugged into the schools and I'd really like to push on that in the schools, having poetry be accessible. I feel a kind of responsibility as an educator myself for um, many of us have strangled the life out of poetry for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I think that kind of academic approach, like let's use poems to teach grammar or let's use poems to teach punctuation is like, well, it's in there. Uh, having said that, I think the old school thing of knowing poems by heart uh, is is great too. You know, it's wonderful to have to have those poems by heart. It really is. Them. When you're talking about the uh, reading the poems in the schools over the PAs, mm -hmm. setting a tone. Right. Um, when I do that within my own mind, I know mm -hmm. that I set a tone for mm -hmm. myself, whatever mm -hmm. that day is, mm -hmm. and I, I. Mm -hmm read into the same thing about mm -hmm. reading poems over the PA of setting mm -hmm. a tone like Right, that. right. I, t I gave out uh, poems at Town Day one year. People could just pick a poem and they were, people were sort of nervous and suspicious about it and they said, what do we do with these or what should, you know, and then are you charging money for these? And it's like, no, they're free poems. But I said, <laughs> what you do is you fold them up and you just stick them in your pocket and sometime before you, ideally, you know, before you do the laundry, you find them mm -hmm. and you pull them out and it will be the right time to have that little poem and read it. That's wonderful. So um, we're hoping to expand uh, that. And I think really, I guess what I feel like, um, Miriam Levine, who was my, uh, was the first poet laureate, had some great ideas and she started having the beehive poets in the library. So um, that's, the, you know, there are beehives on the third floor of the library mm -hmm. and you can see the bees buzzing around and just having kind of drop-in hours. And I think there's a sort of dedicated group of poets who come there. And I think that's a great idea and mm -hmm. I hope to continue that idea. Um, but I also would like to reach out to people who don't think of themselves as poets. So if you like having a conversation, if you like thinking about things and experiencing things, there should be a way into poetry for you. People are always moved by it and engaged with it because we're, we're language mammals, you know? That's <laughs> what we do. Well, you are obviously going to bring a lot of energy to this <laughs> position. We're going to look for poems being revealed, open, uh, open hours at the yeah, library, yeah. and mm -hmm. certainly um, mm -hmm. Poetry Month in April. Thank you so much oh, for joining us. thank you look for talking Look forward to talking to you again yes. during and your tenure. Stay and tuned. And congratulations. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Heather. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Arlington Public News. Welcome to all the new faces in Arlington this fall. Check out more newscasts and our latest segments on the web at acmi.tv news. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Arlington Public. I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us.